What if that nagging feeling in the back of your neck was real? What if those hands reaching out from the dark that you believed were there, were there? What if the monster in the basement really existed? And what if there was really something under the bed? Would you have the courage to face your fears? Welcome back to The Lost Generation. Paul confronts his parents today and gets some shocking information. Stay tuned to find out what happened. I almost can't believe I was even able to sleep that well. The funeral is in a few days and I still have no, so many questions now. The only problem is I can't figure out what to believe. My grandfather didn't seem like the type that would be committed to writing 10 years worth of story for no reason other than enjoyment. He was a very practical man and I wonder if some of what he put in the journal really came to pass but maybe in a way that makes more sense than the dead getting up and walking around. I made my way to the kitchen and saw that my mom was already up and making some breakfast. My dad must still be passed out. He's always been a bit of a night owl, like my grandfather was. I walked over and gave my mom a hug and sat down at the kitchen table. I started flipping through my phone trying to build up the courage to ask her about the journals in 2020. I didn't have to wait long until she brought it up herself. She told me that there was no point in looking into 2020, because it was pretty much a throwaway year. No one was able to do anything, and pretty much just everyone sat around and bickered about everything. She said that the riots calmed down once the winter hit, and just never picked back up again. She said the only real impact was that people started to do things digitally, en masse. People were thrust into the 21st century overnight, and there were definitely growing pains. This honestly sounded like the most plausible thing, and I really didn't press the issue much further. My father walked in and sat down next to me at the kitchen table. He asked if I had anything planned for the day, and I told him that I was just going to veg in my room for most of the day, trying to catch up on schoolwork. He said that there was a great idea, and to come see him later, and we'd get a bite to eat. In all actuality, I had no intention of doing any schoolwork today. I plan on reading more of my grandfather's journal. Just because it wasn't real doesn't mean it isn't fun to read. I finished up my breakfast and grabbed my laptop from the car. I didn't really need it, but I figured I would sell this credibility of my day. I stopped in the old room and grabbed the journal from out the desk. I figured there was no point in reading it in there and just went back to my room where I would be more comfortable. I opened up the book and flipped to the page I had been on and spent the rest of the day reading. September 21st, 2020. So we've managed to set up some barricades blocking the majority of the main roads leading to Dexter. We were also able to flip a school bus onto the bridge that connects to the highway to hopefully slow down whatever ends up coming. Everyone for the most part is just keeping to themselves, but will come out to help if they see people working on something. Most people are just staying in their homes, and to be honest with you, I don't blame them. The only reason I'm out here working on this is because I've seen what happens firsthand when you don't take precautions. The best course of action right now is to hunker down and get ready for when they show up. It's not a matter of if at this point, it's a matter of when. We need to get a headcount on everyone that's in town and find out what everyone is capable of doing. This area has a pretty heavy veteran population due to Fort Drum being 30 minutes away. That might come in handy when they show up. There's pretty much a lot to happen today though. I try to keep writing this journal every day and it feels kind of therapeutic. September 22nd, 2020. We started getting the first wave of people running from the city today. We had to strip search everyone that came in to check for bites. I find this work unpleasant, but it needs to be done to make sure that everyone remains safe. I finally got a hold of Andrew last night, and luckily he is safe. He called while he was on his way from Syracuse to our place. I rerouted him to head here instead of because the city is without a doubt full of them now. He made it here and was a bit banged up, but otherwise safe. It was good to have him here in one piece and have one less thing to worry about. He agreed that hunkering down was the best choice. We should wait a few weeks before trying to go back into the city to scavenge for anything. Fort Drum seems like a good option to go to, but part of me thinks that it could be overrun since it's pretty close to the city. We should probably try and scout it out at some point this week. September 23rd, 2020. We just heard on the radio today that Fort Drum hasn't fallen. It is currently under siege though. Apparently a horde of them, after ravaging Watertown, had eaten their way all the way to Fort Drum. They currently have all available personnel on the wall right now, trying to fight back the horde. My heart goes out to those guys and hopes everything goes well for them. I really wish there was something we could do to help, but I know if we go, we probably won't even make it to the base. Everyone agreed that it wasn't worth the risk. Hopefully in a few days, they can get the horde under control and we can meet up with them. For all we know, they are the last survivors in the area. September 26, 2020. We've been on the run for the last three days. 
I figured all the undead had struck together and went to drum, but I couldn't have been more wrong. It wasn't just a problem externally from the town, but internally as well. Apparently we didn't do a great job checking all the people that came from Watertown, because a few of them had been infected. Simultaneously, we were set upon from both sides as fresh zombies from the city attacked our fortifications. The defenses were holding, but we had a few people that turned in the town that we didn't know of. It's only been a few days, so we didn't have the time or the manpower yet to search each house to make sure they were clear. This was the biggest mistake we could have made. We couldn't even hear them coming in from behind because we were focused on the defenses. The guys watching the bridge that was blocked by the school bus were the first ones to be attacked. Their screams were drowned out by the sheer volume of attackers at our gates. The only reason we are still alive is probably because they don't turn immediately. There is a delay from the time you are infected to the time that you reanimate. That gave us the breathing room to luckily notice the threat and also try to get the hell out of there. Rachel was the first one to realize what was going on because she was checking on the children. She screamed, they're inside! We did the best we could to try and fight off the interior invaders, but unfortunately the defenses started to crumble. Instead of trying to make a stand, we decided to run for it. Everyone jumped in their vehicles and we set off on the road. We didn't know where we would go, but I figured this was a good time as any to head to Fort Drum. I knew they had been surrounded, but I knew the wall pretty well and hoped we could gain access from one of the less used sides. We found an abandoned farmhouse and we were able to set up a perimeter for the night. We had a two-man watch so that people could catch him sleep. At this point it was Rachel, myself, Andrew, and his daughter, Rachel's dad, mom, and brother, and our four kids. We weren't a large element, but luckily the majority of us know how to defend ourselves. We decided that we could push for Fort Drum tomorrow and try to find a way inside. I knew even if we made it inside there'd be a chance that we could be thrown out at this point, but I was out of options. My kids were scared and I had to find somewhere safe for them. The next morning we set out the fort drum and when I said they probably ate their way to drum, I was absolutely right. There was carnage as far as the eye could see. Buildings were on fire, there were bodies littering the ground everywhere. The majority of them looked like they had been through a wood chipper. While we were still safe, I was able to put up some curtains in the back so that the kids couldn't see what was going on outside. I could barely wrap my head around it. I figured it would emotionally destroy them. The only thought I had in my head was that I needed to get to the base so that I could get them all safe. We were able to make it to the perimeter of the base and notice that the Mount Belvedere gate was closed and that would be enough to deter them, but it wouldn't be much for the humans to get through it. All we had to do was scale the fence and open it up. We also needed to deactivate the barriers that were meant to stop people from running through the gate without authorization. Rachel's brother scaled the fence and was able to open the gate for us. I couldn't believe that there was no one here to watch this gate. Either the other side of the base was much worse off than I thought, or the base was, wasn't fully functional anymore. I had spent many nights working the gate when I was an MP, and I had never seen it empty. Once the gate was open, Andrew went inside and deactivated the barriers. We pulled the cars through and closed the gate back up. We even activated the barriers again, just in case. We made our way onto the base and could see that they had their own problems as well. There were body, bodies sprawled across the pavement, but unlike the ones in Watertown, these had been spiked through the head. Whoever had done this must have assumed by killing the brain, you also killed the host. It looked like this side of the base had been completely abandoned, which made a lot of sense. Maybe they consolidated their forces into smaller areas for greater defenses. We decided to head toward the other side of the base and see if anyone was there. We passed a few of them on the way over there, but luckily they were too damn slow to keep up. It took us about 10 minutes to get to the other side because realistically, Fort Drum isn't that big, especially when there isn't any traffic. Also, the lanes are pretty big, which makes it easier to get around abandoned cars. We were just about to go into Gas Alley Gate when an MP pulled up in front of us. He and his partner jumped out of the vehicle with weapons drawn and told us to get out of the vehicle. I couldn't get a good look at him because he was behind his patrol car and the sun was in my eyes, but the voice sounded oddly familiar. I did as he instructed and the other vehicles followed suit. He asked how we had managed to get on drum and I told him that we were able to scale the fence and drop the gate. He looked surprised that no one had, was at the gate. He asked what we had done to the guards that were at the gate. We told him that we didn't see any guards and that the gate was completely empty. He grabbed his radio and gave what I assumed to be dispatch information about the gate. He also said that he had dropped off soldiers over there a few hours ago. He asked what my name was and why I thought it was a good idea to come to the base in the first place. I told him that was Paul Rondo and that I was stationed here a few years back and figured if any place was safe to be it was here. He smiled when he heard my name and holstered his weapon. He said it was good to see me again. I was confused at first until I saw the name of his chest. Davis. He had been new to the traffic section when I was on my way out. He looked a lot older than the last time I had seen him and I was surprised that he even remembered me. He said it was probably a good idea to head back to the battalion area so that we could get the kids somewhere safe and maybe even get something to eat.
I almost didn't even hear the banging on my door at first. I was so sucked into what I was reading that I barely even registered it. I looked at my phone and saw that it was already 3pm. I had spent a good majority of the day reading this journal. I asked who it was at the door and my dad's voice came through. It's me. Wanna go get a bite to eat? This honestly sounded like a pretty good place to stop for the day anyway, so I figured why not. He and I went to a local pizza joint and decided to stay there to eat. While we were sitting there at the table, my dad asked me if I had any luck finding the journal I had mentioned when I first got to my grandparents' house. I didn't think it was a good idea to tell him about the room I had found, because he already seemed pretty odd since my grandfather had passed. I told him that I hadn't had any luck finding it, and I spent the majority of today just working on homework. He seemed satisfied with this answer, and didn't push the subject any further. We finished up our pizza and decided to catch a movie. It had been a really long time since my dad and I had done something like this, so I jumped at the opportunity. We had a few drinks at a local bar after the movie, and I decided that I would try and get some more information from my dad, because this time, I hoped that he would have his guard down. I asked him about 2020, and asked if Grandpa had, has ever mentioned anything about zombies to him. He looked confused at first, but was so smashed that he said, yeah, they used to scare me when I was a kid. I asked, do you mean zombies in movies? He said, no, the ones that my dad used to warn me that were outside the walls. I again didn't push any further, but the shock from the bombshell shook me so deep. This wasn't the writing of a madman or a guy bored during quarantine. These are the writings of a man that had fought through a decade-long zombie war. I'm going to read even more of the book tomorrow morning and try to get to the bottom of this. Hopefully my dad won't realize what he said. Hey, I wanted to thank everybody for listening to The Lost Generation. Come back next week to find out what happened in the past on Fort Drum. <laughs>